This is Journey to Chinese Fluency podcast, episode number one. This is my journey to Chinese fluency. 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 Embarrassing moment. Culture insights. Proven methods to achieve Chinese fluency. Skip that learning curve with the Journey to Chinese Fluency podcast. Now, your host, Victor Yang. Hello, everyone. Victor Yang here, and welcome to Journey to Chinese Fluency. Today, I am joined by Da Shan or Mark Rosewell, which is his English name. Da Shan is the most famous foreigner in China. Pretty much anyone in China. Who has had a TV at home knows him. Da Shan is known for his super fluent Mandarin Chinese and his cross talk on Chinese TV. Well, cross talk or xiangsheng is basically the Chinese style stand up comedy. I remember watching Da Shan xiangsheng since I have memory. 你好，大山。你好。Welcome to the show. Thank you. Are you ready to share with us your journey to Chinese fluency? Sure. It's been a long journey. You know, I started studying Chinese in 1984 it, at the University of Toronto. So I didn't know any Chinese until I started university,、uh, 19 years old. And I remember at the time, a teacher in the Department of East Asian Studies saying, "You know, basically to learn a language to fluency is basically a 10-year project." Well, of course, in university, we're only there for four years, right? Unless we go on、yes. to a master's or something. And I remember thinking, "Wow, this will be really interesting for a couple of years." But I don't know if I really want to spend ten years. I really want to spend ten years. That sounds like a long time. And then after about twenty years, I looked back and I thought, "Yeah, that's probably that's probably pretty accurate. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it takes ten years. It's not. Although I have to say, my my the main point I always want to make when we talk about language learning and learning Chinese and everything is that we talk too much about how difficult it is. Really, what I found primarily over my you know journey of studying Chinese is it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, you really enjoy it, and in fact."、Um, It's sometimes you know for me I kind of lose perspective because this has been thirty three years now, right?、Um, but actually, you know, I meet young students that have studied Chinese for say two years at university and come to China on an exchange program. Like my nephew is one, two years of Chinese at the University of Ottawa, comes to China. You can't say he's fluent, but he's totally functional. He's walking around, he's talking to people, he's figuring out how to buy tickets, how to do it, you know, order food at a restaurant. He's talking to his. I heard him talking to his teacher on the telephone. Not only like using straight direct language, but you know, using polite language, sort of talking around, beating around the bush a little bit. And you know, that's that's not easy. But he did that、mm-hmm. in two years. And I meet a lot of people like that. That you know, within two years, can reach a certain level of not fluency but functionality. Wow, I'm surprised you just went straight into sharing your journey already. Like, you know, you you're going super fast. Sorry. Anyway, let's let's slow down a bit. It's just before we talk about how exactly like you learned your Chinese. Let's talk about why did you start learning your Chinese? Well, honestly, just for fun. I mean, I just right. That's why I always say it's 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 something that's a lot of fun to do.、Um, you know, language is something that、um, it's it's the best way really to learn about a different country and a different culture. Culture. And so, why did I start learning Chinese? It's basically just because I was eighteen, nineteen years old, and I was finishing high school. And you know, in Canada, of course, we all learn French. English Canadians, anyway,、mm. growing up as an English Canadian, because it's a bilingual country, we all learn French in high school. That's our that's our、uh, second language.、Uh, and of course, you know, I'm typical. High school kid, I didn't want to learn French. It's something that we had to do. So, do you still speak French? No, I have. A, so, I have a foundation in French, but I can't really speak French. I guess the what you know to come to that to the point of your question. The reason I started studying Chinese was kind of a backlash against learning French. You know,、mm. when people say I'm, you know, you often hear in Chinese, 语言天赋 right? This guy is the gift of languages. He's、yeah. he's gifted. Well, not really, because if I was gifted in languages, I wouldn't have failed French so badly, right?、Mm, that's <laughs> I think interesting. It's all about, I think it's all about interest. Yeah. So Chinese is just something that interested me, and in, and really to start with, it's just an interest in learning about the world, learning about a country or a culture that's different than yours. It's just you know,、uh, a typical eighteen, nineteen year old. Kid wants to go out and 
see the world, right? So that's it was really just a curiosity to start with. That's a great point. You mentioned that learning a language is not just about the gift; it's rather you having an interest in the language. Maybe like you can tell us about why Chinese is a good language to learn. Well, actually, so this is this is the point I like to make. You know, some some parts of learning Chinese are really difficult. Some parts are easier. So, for instance, compared to French,、um, you know, the problem we have learning French is、uh, first of all, all nouns have a gender, so it's they're either they're separated into female or male. Yeah, and. Uh, I think I heard once that typical. This, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why is a table female or male? Yep. <laughs> yep. Not table, right? It's female. It doesn't make、yep. any sense. And a lot of it is, you know, a lot of things in language don't make sense. It's just that's the way they've evolved, and everyone accepts it. I remember in French, one example, chèvre, which means goat cheese.、Mm. So le chèvre, if you use a masculine, le chèvre means a goat, or la chèvre means goat cheese. I don't know. It's just、wow. you know, <laughs> all these things. You just have to memorize them. Also in French, one of the things that's even more difficult than English is verb tenses, right?、Mm. So、uh, whether it's first person or second person or first person plural, I mean,、yep. they all have、yep. they all have different、um, conjugations, the verb conjugations, and that's why anybody learning French knows you just have to memorize it,、yes. you know. Um, so first of all, to, to come back to Chinese, Chinese has no verb conjugations. A verb is a verb;、mm. it has no tenses. That's right. Nouns have no gender. A table is just a table. Yeah, very simple、uh, and straightforward. So, th- in fact, Chinese grammar is relatively simple. I mean, you you have to learn sentence, certain st- sentence structures, like what, you know, for instance, a really common one is we call ba zhi ju. That's using、yes. a character with ba, and all that does is take the object and it moves it before the verb. Yes. So it's like a simple rule, and you learn the rule, and it's okay. When you're learning English, you know English speakers don't remember this, but for anyone who's learned English as a second language, for every grammatical rule you learn, you have to learn 25 exceptions. I totally agree. I went through that painful process. Well, and so for us, we just—that's the way we grew up talking at home and in society and everything. So we take know, it for granted. Yeah, we, we, it's kind of a feeling. We have a feeling for the language. If you don't have a feeling for the language, you just have to memorize every rule one by one, and that's a—that's a terrible. Thing to do. <laughs> yes. So in that sense, I mean, in those specific examples,、um, Chinese is easier than English.、Mm. You know, in other parts, it's more difficult. Like the tones, getting getting used to the tones, the written characters, and everything. Sure, those parts are are more difficult. But sometimes we focus too much on the difficulties, and we forget to tell people actually, you know, some things are actually pretty easy about Chinese. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, definitely. You basically had a very good argument about why Chinese is actually not that hard as people would imagine. Well, what about、um, in other aspects of Chinese? Like Chinese is a good language to learn. For example,、um, would that open up a lot of opportunities? Well, it definitely is the case for you. Yeah. Well, first of all, if you're, you know, even if you're wanting to go to China as a As a tourist, you know, not obviously not if you're just going for like two weeks or something. Then, then you know, maybe it wouldn't make sense. But for instance, say you want to go backpacking through Asia and you want to spend like two months in China, traveling around. You know, if you just did six weeks or something of English of Chinese language education, that would be so much help in learning how to you know get train tickets,、um, negotiate with taxi drivers,、uh, simple simple sort of transactional Chinese. This is one thing I think that people don't、uh, realize about Chinese. Is that、um, it's relatively easy to communicate, and even if you only say you only have a couple of weeks of Chinese education, or maybe six months or something, you go to China. The fact that you've made an effort and that you've got just the basics, you can say hello. I'm from Australia. Nice to meet you. You know, what, how long does it take to learn that? Right? You can learn that in an hour.、Uh, even saying that. It opens so many doors for you because all of a sudden people, you know, they, Chinese people love it when foreigners make an effort to learn the language and culture, and something like that, just simple phrases, can make it so much easier in daily life or or in traveling around China. Obviously, of course, if you want to be doing business or you want to be, you know, studying like academic study of China, then obviously, you know, studying a few months isn't enough. But、uh, the more you know, the better, and.、Um, You know, so much is lost in translation, and so much that I see the communication between China and the West are really talking in parallels. Like you say what you're saying, I say what I'm saying. None of us are really talking to each other, right? And、mm. often those things are lost in translation. 
And yes. so if you don't have if you don't have a knowledge of the language and you're trying to do business in China, I mean just just you know look at it from the other side. Can you imagine a Chinese business person coming to Australia not speaking a word of English and trying to do business in Australia? Well, they could mm. go to the Chinese community and do business in the Chinese community. That's okay. Mm. But you know trying to do business with a mainstream uh, Australian business and only working through translators, people mm. do that, but it's a tremendous disadvantage. And yes. the same thing with English speakers going to China. You can still work in English there through translators and everything. Just remember that you've immediately lost at least like 25% of your efficiency. You just flush it down the toilet because you're using a translator. That's a very good point. It's just like watching TV in black and white versus watching it in, in color. Maybe. I mean, you can imagine the reds and the yellows and the blues and everything, and you know you can still watch yeah. it when it's in black and white. But that's you just true. again, that's a good analogy. I mean, you just lost a lot of information right there. Yes. And the same thing with working in translation, you can still roughly get the job done. Mm. You might have more accidents and more screw ups because you know because of the language issue. You can basically get it done, mm. but you just have to you just have to recognize that you're working at a tremendous disadvantage. That's right. And it doesn't also, matter how good your translators are; it's the process of translation itself. Yes, that's right. And also like. The there's a huge Mandarin speaking population nowadays in the world. Pretty much everywhere you go, there's Chinese people speaking Mandarin Chinese, and it'll be a huge advantage for you to be able yeah. to understand. Well, I mean, maybe we'll mention that at the end, but I mean, that's exactly what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm traveling the world performing my stand up comedy in Chinese, and basically, uh, you know, the audience that I'm speaking to in Melbourne is the same audience as in Toronto or Vancouver. And in fact, that audience is also in Buenos Aires and they're in Budapest and they're in Prague and they're in Helsinki. So like mm. I could go to all of those cities and speak Chinese. Awesome. Everywhere. That's a very good skill to have. To me, like I learn English now. I'm happy I'll be, I'm able to communicate you with you in <laughs> English. This is kind of weird because I don't expect me to talking to Da Shen in English. This is so weird. Anyway. I know. Well, that's the that's thing, like, right? Because we're doing an English program, we have to speak in English. But actually, for yeah. us, it would probably be easier to speak in Chinese. Yes, <laughs> yes. To our audience, you know, before the show, I pretty much only speak Chinese with Dasha and it's just have no language barrier at all. Anyway, so since you speak so good Mandarin Chinese, please share with us your method of learning Chinese and what has been the most effective technique or method that's been working for you learning Chinese. Well, I think there's perhaps an overemphasis on really specific methods, and often that tends to be sort of a marketing gimmick. So like if somebody is trying to sell you a specific course or a specific book, they'll always talk about the technique. You know, this is a really important technique and everything. And yeah, sure, there's there's all kinds of different techniques. I don't know if you can really settle on one. Um, I'm a little skeptical about that. I think in general, you have to use the language. You can't just, you can't just be passive and sit back and memorize and then fill in the blanks. You have to get used to using it in your daily life. Um, I often say, you know, this is kind of a more theoretical or conceptual idea, but you have to take a foreign language and turn it into your second language, right? That's And that's a totally different concept. A foreign language is somebody else's language. A second language is your own language. It's not anybody mm. else's. You own it. You You spent the time and the effort, you made the effort, and you acquired that language. You know, it's like going to a store and you buy a hammer. Once you bring the hammer home, it's not the store's hammer anymore. It's your hammer. Right? That's so, a very interesting So, so that's what I think of. The Chinese is, for me, it's not a foreign language. It's my second language. Sure, it'll never replace my mother tongue. And, it, you know, my, my Chinese is never quite as good as my, my, my mother tongue as my first language. But, you know, I use that language as my own language to express my own thoughts and my own feelings and everything. I'm not... I'm not just repeating what other people say. I'm saying what I'm thinking, right? So it's it's my language. That's something that you can only get to through practice. And, you know, like to talk about a specific thing, the tones are sort of a feel to the language. At first, you have to think about it, right? Ma, 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 ma. You have to think about the tones. You get to a point where you're used to speaking and you've spoken so much that the tones just sound right. Mm. And if you don't do the tones correctly, it doesn't sound right. I mean, even, right. even a fluent speaker sometimes will mess up the tones. You know, just because you're tired or, you know, you trip on your tongue or something, you get the wrong tone. But as soon as you hear it yourself, you know it's wrong and you back up and you repeat it. Mm. So a lot of, I think, language really fundamentally, it's all just about using it, making it your own and, and you know, practice, 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 but not practice in the sense of just repeating other people's stuff. Figure out yourself, how would I say that? 
Mm. Right. So, you know, for instance, today or yesterday I was doing, I've been doing these live webcasts, right. That are really popular now. Yep. Um, and so I, one of the nice things about doing a live webcast is you can just walk around with a cell phone and just shoot what you're doing. And, you know, I'm doing it all in Chinese, right? So I'm sort of showing people, here I am in Melbourne, and I went into this. I said, here's a nice restaurant. Should I go in here? And everyone goes, yeah, 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 that looks good. To <laughs> and so then I took the phone and I, you know, here's shooting a picture of the of the menu and everything. And then I'm thinking to myself, you know, how would I say that in Chinese and everything? So you're, you're just constantly practicing about how would I do that? How would I do that? Mm-hmm. Um, that's the main thing. That's right. the main thing. So that's a very interesting point you, you brought out, which is making the distinction between a second language and a foreign language. A foreign language. That's a very good point. So for, for me, you know, obviously I'm not Chinese. I'm born and raised in Canada. I'm mm. Caucasian by race and uh, don't have any sort of Chinese influence in the family, really. Mm. Um, you know, my grandparents visited China in the 1920s. That's only – that's a little piece of history. But, you know, I come from a typical non-Chinese mm. Canadian family. Yeah. But for me, Chinese is not a foreign language anymore. It's my second language. Yep. When you started learning Chinese, you started learning in university, did you? Yeah, that's a real disadvantage, right? Because this is one problem I think we have with Chinese language education in the West is that, you know, it's getting a little bit better now, right? Some primary schools and middle schools start Mm. having Chinese courses, but really the majority of Westerners still start learning Chinese in university or at least at the age of sort of 17, 18 and up, which is a big disadvantage to start with. That's true. The younger, the better, I guess. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine if Chinese university students started off first year learning the alphabet? Like, mm. you know, how are, you, how are they expecting to graduate from university if we're teaching them the alphabet in first year? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So basically, after you graduated from university, you went straight to Beijing, did you? Yeah. Oh. So, I, uh, so I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I took it in first year university really just out of curiosity. I thought I'll take a course and I'll, you know, university is a chance to broaden your horizons and yeah. learn about the world. So I just thought, okay, let me try this, uh, try a course in Chinese. I really enjoyed it. So second year, I started to major in it. And then uh, third year, fourth year, I just really focused on learning Chinese language, classical literature, uh, history, politics, philosophy, even wow. archaeology. Just took, you know, wow. just, just took, just took a course in just about everything. So then I thought, okay, I've got my BA in Chinese studies from the University of Toronto. Obviously, the next step is to go to China for six months or a year of immersion, right? And then, and then think about what to do next. I don't know. I didn't have mm. any long term plan. Um, so I went to. So I ended up at uh, Beijing University. Then for independent studies, right? So basically, you did further study. Yeah, in, but in I didn't Beijing. do a I didn't do a degree program. I didn't get a master's or anything. Okay. I just stayed in independent studies, which is basically self study. I and guess that's how I got into comedy because you know yeah, why not? Right. Yeah, and why not have some fun with it? So I guess once you arrived at Beijing, you basically immerse yourself into the environment. Well, here's here's the here's the big advantage I had with through through by luck really through chance um, was that I got. You know, I went to the TV station just because I was invited randomly to do a show and, you know, strange things happen when you're traveling the world. You get all mm. kinds of opportunities that maybe you wouldn't uh, back at home. Um, so I went to the TV and I did this show and boom, you know, who would have expected? But the little skit we did was really successful. And I got to meet some of these uh uh, you know, the outstanding comedians of the day, and yes. they took me under their wing and started to teach me xiangsheng uh, or crosstalk. Uh, and for me, in fact, looking back now, I realize what that really meant or what that really, was, you know, signified for me was was a, an immersion environment. Because mm. as a foreigner, you get to China in a Chinese university. It's full of really bright Chinese students who all speak pretty good English because they've been learning it, you know, since since primary school. Right. And they all want to practice their English. Um, and in a big city like Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen, you can kind of get around speaking English a lot. Yeah. So it's very hard, actually. And, you're of course, you're surrounded by other foreigners. So you're meeting foreigners from all around the world, and it's really fascinating. And I had all kinds of friends from Europe and South America and Africa and all over. <laughs> so you're not necessarily speaking Chinese all the time. Mm. Um, but for me, the lucky thing was I got in with this group of comedians, and, uh, you know, they're they're into this Chinese, very traditional form of comic dialogue. And... Um, 
you know, frankly, the big advantage for me is that none of them spoke any English. Right. <laughs> so that's great. So I'm hanging out for two or three years with these guys and, you know, everything day in, day out, it was just all Chinese. Did you already reach a very fluent level when you meet those comedians? So again, I think after four years, I was functional. I see. So you can, there's actually a, a video record of this because if you go back and look at the first shows I did in 1988, that basically represents the Chinese level that I learned at the University of Toronto in four years, which was pretty good. I mean, I could, I could read a newspaper and I could uh, engage in, you know, in relatively complex discussions and everything, but I still had a pretty heavy foreign accent because I had learned Chinese. Uh, at university in Toronto, and right. you know lots of Chinese around and everything, but it's not an immersion environment. Um, so, so, how do you work on your accent? Well, it, I don't know. Just being in the just being in the environment. So I didn't actually work. I didn't like actually practice. You know,、mm-hmm. it's just as you're as you're living and breathing the language and using it every day, you naturally pick up a lot of the mannerisms and the、uh, the style of talking of the local population. So, for instance, you know, if I, I've I heard a lot of the Chinese people that I've met in Australia, and of course, when they speak English, they speak it with an Australian accent, right? Because that's、yes. just the language they hear all the time here. So, for me, I didn't actually sit down and say, "Okay, I'm going to do the R Y Yin," right? The the R and、yep. at all of the words that. You That's the that's sort of the typical. That's right. So、uh, Beijing I, style. Yeah, yeah, I guess when you just arrived at Beijing, you probably didn't learn the the Erhua in the Erzhen. Well,、Erzim. no. So you you so well. That's it's a little bit strange there because、uh, technically some of the Erhua in is standard Chinese. Yes. But of course, Beijing the Beijing dialect, which is different from standard Chinese,、mm. is sort of. Ninety-five percent the same, but you know, Beijing dialect has its own certain. It is it is a local dialect, and it has a lot more of the R endings. Tell us a bit more about the Beijing accent, and what's your opinion on that? So, well, Beijingers like to Beijingers like to.、Uh, the, it's a very lazy kind of. Yeah. I don't know. Where's your hometown in China? I'm from Beijing. You're from Beijing, yeah. Well, I mean, the typical, you know, there's the educated sort of university Beijing people, but if you just go on the street or the taxi drivers, you、yes. know, that's everything is kind of yes, yes. It's all sort of it's all sort of like half swallowed at the back of their mouth, and so many R endings. That's why it all just then comes out saying. Can you give us an example? Hey, Kumar.、Uh, <laughs> so, for instance,、uh, you know, I, I sometimes think of this example at the end of a, at the end of a show. We would say, okay, that's the show for tonight. That that brings us to the end of the program.、Um, and so, in man in Mandarin, standard Mandarin,、uh, you would say, "Ah,、oh, 我们的我们的节目到这里就结束了 That would、mm-hmm. be standard Mandarin. So, if you were doing it like in Beijing slang, you would say, "Ah,、uh, 我们今儿这个节目就这么着了 <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is so Beijing. <laughs> yep. The other example I can think of、um, when I just came to Australia,、um, I spoke with like very heavy Beijing accent. Yeah, and some of my classmates were just couldn't understand、like、Chinese、it. classmates. Yeah, Chinese classmates. That's exactly what I'm referring to. For example,、uh, if you want to say I don't know,、uh, in Mandarin, normal Mandarin is 不知道 right?、Mm. But then in Beijing, 不知道 Yep, exactly. 不知道 <laughs> So you see, it's 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 rolled together with、yep. an R. 不知道 Yeah. So yeah. So for you know, I travel all around, and obviously, the Beijing accent is my own accent now,、mm. right? It's I've just that's just something I've acquired. But I do pay. You know, you have to do. You have to pay attention to not necessarily speak textbook Chinese, but at least sort of tone down the Beijing. So some things are easy to remember. Like in in Beijing, instead of Jin Tian, we would just say Jir. Yes. Right. Jin Tian Jir, Ming Tian Mir. Yeah. So those kind of things you you learn to you learn to tone down. But you know, like I said, in standard Putonghua, the R ending is still something that、uh, that is commonly used. Yes, 不一会儿 right? Yes, that's right. There's still still a lot of R、um, you know, sounds. Here's a tricky thing, though. This is to get a little bit more technical. Sometimes the tones in Beijing dialect are different. Have you ever noticed? So, for、okay. instance, in Beijing dialect, in standard Mandarin, the Friendship Hotel would be "you、uh, 一宾馆 Okay, 有一有一一 should be fourth tone. In Beijing、oh. dialect, we say 有一 Yeah, that's true. You ever notice that it becomes second tone? That's true. I would say 有一 actually. 有一 yeah.、Oh, so that's that's a that's a subtle difference. But those are、mm-hmm. kind of things. Like I remember once hosting a show on TV, and I was saying,、uh, so you know, let's you know celebrating our friendship. 我们的友谊 which is what we would say in Beijing. 我们的友谊 But it's your e. If you look at the dictionary, it's your e. Really, yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. <laughs> well, if you go out of Beijing, do people actually say your e? 
Yeah, so with Yu Yi is sort、Because、of more I, real I, local. Yeah, I I kind of feel that Yu Yi is pretty much the generic way, like most Chinese will say, but get it wrong. Yeah, well, of course, this is true with any language too. There's sometimes there's the way the language is spoken in real life, and、mm. then there's the textbook language that people.、Yes. Yeah, and sometimes you know you'll correct like native speakers saying, you know, look at here, you know, here, this is right in writing in the dictionary.、Yep. It says it's pronounced this way,、yep. but that's not the way people speak in real life. That's right. And you know, I think there's a different philosophy. In Chinese language, in that there is, you know, with the English language, there's no official government body that decides what is standard English.、Mm. There's American English, there's British English, there's Australian English, there's Canadian English,、yes. and in, even in, with Canadian English, there's no government body that says this is standard Canadian English.、Mm. But in Chinese and in French, you do actually have a government body、um, that determines that this is the standard proper. You know, and then of course all of the、uh, professional broadcasters and everything are、mm. expected to adhere to that standard.、Yep. So in that sense, there is like there is the standard. I think the philosophy. What I'm trying to get to here, the in in English, the philosophy is language is living, right? So、mm. whatever. Is the people speak、mm. that is the language, and dictionaries should change to reflect what the what society、yes. uh, has determined. In China, there's a little bit more of the philosophy that you know this government body should determine what is proper Chinese, and then we teach that standard, and people、yep. should adhere to that standard. That's、right? true. That's true. But most of the time, when people are talking. People don't really pay attention to those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really it's broadcasters.、Mm. So for instance, I'm always mixed up. A rose is it Meigui or Mei? Is Mei yeah, Mei Mei Gui, Mei yeah, Meigui or Meigui, right? I just always feel like uncomfortable saying Meigui, although I know it is the correct pronunciation. But whenever I want to say that, I probably still say Meigui because. That is. Yeah, Meigui sounds strange. Yeah, it does sound. But strange. But if you were working for CCTV or you know China Radio International or something、yep. like that, they would insist that you say Meigui. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So, what had been your biggest challenge in learning Chinese, and how did you overcome it? So、uh, I've talked a little bit about what I think is easier about learning Chinese. What's What's harder? I really don't think the tones are that hard. The tones, the tones are really hard for the first couple of months, and then it kind of makes sense when you stop thinking about them. At the beginning, of course, you have to think about it, right? This is second tone. That's third tone. This is fourth tone. And as soon as you think about it, it becomes kind of stiff. So would you so, say you have to practice until it becomes your second nature? Yeah, but I don't think. You know, they say you know the Chinese is difficult because it's a tonal language. I think that's really at a beginner's level. It's it's one of the difficult things, but it's one of the things that you overcome relatively soonly. There goes my English relatively quickly. <laughs>、um, the characters again are really hard to learn at first because it's pure memory work. Yes, and not just the characters, but the components. So this component, this is a soldier, and this is a tea show. Yes, and this is three dots for water, san dian shui, right? You have those、mm. are things you just have to memorize. Yes, and the funny thing is, Chinese people often because that's what the language that you grew up with, and it, and it makes sense, right? Like Chinese people always say, "Oh, the character for a mountain,、mm. see, it looks like a mountain." Well, if you show somebody who's not Chinese. This character Shen, and you say, "See, it looks like a mountain." It honestly, it's hard to visualize. It doesn't look like a mountain at all. It only、yep. looks like a mountain if, like, that's the way you've been programmed from birth to think what a mountain、yeah. looks like. <laughs> it just looks like three sticks. Like,、yep. why is three sticks a mountain? That doesn't make sense. Well, it's three peaks. Okay, I get it. <laughs>、um, so the characters at first, it's pure memory work. Yeah. But the, the the catch there is that the more you know, the easier it is to learn new ones because they build on each other. Mm. And it's an organic system that, in total, makes sense. So when you first learn, you know the first one percent, two percent, three percent, that's difficult because you're only seeing that little bit of the、yes. puzzle. So would you say the key is to persistence in learning, like in memorizing? Yeah, persistence. I think so. That's, that's those are two examples I've given where I think those are things that people think about really being difficult with Chinese. But I just like to tell people, you know, those are most difficult at the beginner stage. Actually, the further you go, the easier they become. I think honestly, one of the most difficult things about Chinese, the grammar is simple. The The, uh, the you know the the these tones and things those are things that gradually work themselves out.、Um, the、uh, set phrases in Chinese, and not just Chengyu. People think about Chengyu, right? Which are four、mm-hmm. character set phrases that usually come from a story.、Mm-hmm. So so、uh, you know it's a it's a traditional story, and then it's、yep. just been summarized. It's like the title of a story, basically. Right. But by for any Chinese person, as, you, as soon as you hear the 
title of the story, you remember the story. So, for instance, you know, uh, you know, in English we might say sour grapes. Well, what does sour grapes mean? Like, you know, sour grapes, well, it means about, you know, you think about Aesop's fable and you remember the story of sour mm-hmm. grapes or or whatever. So those are really common in Chinese. Those are cheng yu. Yes. But not just cheng yu. It's also, I would say in Chinese, yue ding su cheng de yuan, right? Yep. Things that are just sort of have become, what do you call that? I, how would you explain that in English? See, sometimes it's easier to explain things in Chinese. <laughs> things that are just sort of set phrases. Yes. And it's just something that's evolved. And sometimes they're historical references. Sometimes they're references to poetry. So, for mm-hmm. instance, they it might be or from the classics, classical literature. Yes. Um, There's uh, a lot of those. A lot of those. And it's just not always for characters. Yeah. And I mean, even after 30 years, I still hear ones or see ones that, that I don't know. And I look it up and I, yeah. Mm. People use that all the time. Yeah. You know, like once I, this is a, not a recent example, but I remember once I was doing a, um, a show and that my co-host said, uh, yeah, 你是, you really, uh, 胸有成竹. Okay. So, 胸有成竹 literally means like you have a bamboo in your, bamboo your chest. in your chest, right? <laughs> it's, it's, your bamboo in your chest is, yep. and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's mature. It's grown, right? Mm. It's, you, you have, you have mature bamboo in your chest. Well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> you know, 胸有成竹, <laughs> well, it just means, it just means that you're ready. You're very you've, confident. You, yeah, you're confident. You're prepared. You've got yep. what it takes. You're ready for the task. You, yep. the bamboo in your heart is like already, like, why is there bamboo in my heart, right? It doesn't yeah. make sense. <laughs> but, uh, it, but, you know, again, so that's not a chunk. Mm-hmm. That's not a sort of traditional story or something. It's just a set phrase. And I don't know where that comes from. Does it come from a piece of poetry or it comes from some famous saying? So those kinds mm. of things you never finish learning. Yes. But uh, that being said, uh, that's that's one of the ways you show your your skill or yes. how erudite or how well educated you are in Chinese. Yes. But if you don't know those, that makes the language very concise and very beautiful, actually. I mean, mm. that's uh, that's really one yes. of the attractions of the Chinese language is how beautiful it is. If you don't know how to say it the beautiful way, there's always a clumsy way to say it. That's right. Even Chinese have to learn all those as well. Like, for me, there's still a lot of set phrases I don't even understand. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's well, definitely, and I think that's important too. Like even with English, I sometimes hear words or phrases, or maybe you know, maybe I've heard it before, but I never really thought, what actually does that mean? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's my that's my native language, so I still look things up in English to see what it means. Yes. Uh, yeah. Somebody this last week called me because said my programs were occasionally scabulous. I thought, what's scabulous? Scab scabulous. Wow. I never heard that word, so I looked it up. Well, literally, it means covered in scabs. Okay. It's covered in scabs, but it means it's sort of rough right. and kind of unpolished and sort of a little bit, you know, a little bit. Uh, so what he was what he was referring to is that my programs, what I'm doing now, aren't sort of sort of polished and you know it's a little bit rough around the edges and a little okay. bit okay, a little bit risky and a little bit challenging. That's what he was saying. So right. he used the word scabulous. I thought, well, you know, wow. I'm a native speaker of English. I I don't know what scabulous is. Covered in scabs. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the same, I think it's important to have that, you know, to, to enjoy learning and yes. to enjoy and to look at it as a year long task. Like yes. Learning Chinese is not just four years at university and then you're finished. Definitely. And nothing in life is like that. Mm. Well, there's a lot of um, dialects in China. There's so many dialects in China and people speak with accent. How did you deal with all that? How did you get used to people yeah. speaking with accent. So if you're living outside of the Mandarin dominant areas of China, which, you know, geographically is large, large areas like the whole West, basically all of southern China, mm. the Mandarin is dominant sort of from the northeast China through the central plains and sort of down through Sichuan and Yunnan. There, it's still close to Mandarin, but the tones are all different. That's, that's the main thing that's different. Mm. When you get down to a place like Fujian, or, you know, even Shanghai, Fujian, Guangdong, these places, the dialect is, you know, really, really different. I mean, mm-hmm. all, um, mutually unintelligible. Um, that being said, of course, you know, since 1949, Mandarin has been pushed throughout the language as the national language. So you can you can get by with Mandarin anywhere. Mm. If you're going to be living in, you know, a place in southern China or in Sichuan or, or someplace like that, you might – or even Shanghai – even though, you know, Shanghai is so many foreigners in Shanghai now, you can just speak English. <laughs> right. But, you know, you, you gradually would pick that up. I think accents, um, again, it's more to do with flexibility. Like the more you've heard, 
Chinese being spoken poorly in different parts, you know, you get mm. you, you you sort of build in a flexibility, like you guess, right? Oh, yes. he must be saying this, even though he's saying it wrong. So <laughs> I guess it takes some time to hear yeah, it and that's practice. much more about exposure. So for instance, mm. so for instance, I'm not a native speaker in of uh, Chinese, but. I grew up and I, I learned Chinese in Toronto, which is a city where, at least in the 1980s, when I was studying Chinese there, Cantonese was by far the most dominant mm. dialect. So we'd go to Chinatown and we'd hear Cantonese being spoken all the time. Yes, and uh, and you know, in school, like all the there are all kinds of students from Hong Kong and everything. There weren't that many students from mainland China back then at mm. a university like like Toronto. Lots and lots of students from Hong Kong. Yes. So we had more exposure to Cantonese. And even though I don't speak Cantonese, and you know, I don't, I, you know, I, I know a few phrases. That's all. But the fact that I've been exposed to it is that means that I can understand mm. more than, for instance, this is a good example. My wife was born and raised in Beijing, mm. so growing up not hearing any Cantonese except for maybe some from pop songs, right? But never hearing Cantonese in the street. I noticed once we were in Toronto on a street, uh, uh, and this elderly gentleman came up and asked my wife for directions because he saw she was Chinese, mm. and so he asked her in Cantonese, you know, how do I right. get, how do I get to the Scarborough Town Center? Okay, and I swear I, I I understood the first time he said it, even though I you know well, I, he was asking you know where do I find bus number eighty five to Scarborough and I remember you know Scarborough is Scarbao I think it's Scarbao <laughs> in Mandarin and you know Bashu how Chu would be a ba anyway but something, yeah. Anyway, I could I could pick it up, right? Mm. He's looking for bus eighty five to Scarborough Town Center, right? And my wife, born and raised native Chinese speaker, but born and raised in Beijing with no exposure to Cantonese, just drew a total blank. Had no idea what he was talking about. Oh. And so he repeated it a second time, and yeah. she was still like, "Sorry, <laughs> I don't know." <laughs> so finally, I answered him in Mandarin. Wow! I said, "That's on the far side, bus eighty five, take to Scarborough Town Center." Well, it's the last your wife stop. Must be impressed. And the guy, you know, being you know, from Hong Kong, probably or, yeah. or from he could understand Mandarin. At yeah. least he couldn't pick it himself. He just sort of looked at me, and his sort of his eyes like <laughs> googled in his head, and he just went, mm, "Guys, hi." <laughs> <laughs> nice one, nice so, one. So yeah, I, uh, learning. I, that's my point. Is this? Different dialects or different accents of Chinese. It's sure. really a, it's about exposure. Yes, like you know, yeah. if you've if you've hung out in Shanghai enough, you get used to the way Shanghai people speak Mandarin, yeah. even though it's not totally yeah. standard. So the key word here is exposure. All right. So can you share with us? Well, definitely, you definitely have a lot to share with us about an embarrassing or a funny moment when you were learning Chinese. So the example I always use is uh, when I first arrived in Beijing and uh, a friend that I just recently met invited me to go home for a birthday celebration for his mother. And I just thought, wow, I've only been in China like six weeks and I made this friend and he's already invited me back to his home. This is a real honor and, you know, I should make sure to bring a present to remember my manners. Mm -hmm. uh, don't go empty handed. And so I just thought, oh, your mother's ha having a birthday. I'll bring some flowers. Right, so, so of course, flowers. I can kind of guess what even, happens. Well, even in in you know in basic Chinese, that's a probably first year Chinese. We learn that flowers is hua hua. Yes. So in, you know we we put the r ending on in Beijing. Yes. Hua hua is flowers, but what hua? So of course, yeah, you've guessed the ending. I said, yeah, you will give me mama song yiga hua chuan ba. Hua chuan, right? And hua chuan, hua chuan is a circle oh, of flowers. Man. And of course, in Chinese tradition, that's what you present at a funeral. It's yep. a, a circular pattern of flowers. Wow. You know, we don't have that tradition in the West, right? Yeah. A, a circle of flowers <laughs> is something you give at a funeral. Yep. So that's the difference between a hua chuan or a hua lan yep. or yi su hua mm -hmm. or yi zhi hua. This is one of the things that's more complicated about Chinese is learning the... Measure words. Yep, the measure words. So we don't have a lot of them in English. So, for instance, we say a pair of shoes, a pack of cards, a loaf of bread. Right? Those mm -hmm. are those are mm -hmm. measure words. Chinese is full of measure words. So basically, I was getting the measure word wrong. Right? Is it a is it a bouquet of flowers? Is it a circle of flowers? Is it a is it a handful of flowers? Mm. What what kind of anyway? So I said, yeah, basically, I'll, I'll send your mom some funeral flowers. <laughs> oh, that's a funny one. Well, um, share with us, like since you mentioned about the culture difference, so why don't you share with us one special thing about the Chinese culture that is different to your own culture? 
Well, in Chinese, I have to say there's a Chinese saying I don't agree with, which is 理多人不怪 right? It doesn't、okay. like does it? You can all you can never be too polite. That's how you'd say it in English,、yeah. I guess. You can never be too polite, right?、Hmm. There's always 理 is like manners or、yeah. ritual or or formality.、Um, so nobody sort of nobody ever complains about having too much manners or too much formality, and that's just not true,、hmm. right? So if you're if you are really just super polite all the time. That's actually a way of sort of keeping your distance from people. It's not very friendly、mm. if you're treating people、mm. like with proper, you know, like、yep. like you're meeting the Queen of England or something. You know, <laughs> that's not there. There is sort of there is a、uh, a limit to politeness.、Mm. That's true. Yeah, you don't want to be too polite, but that's a traditional saying. Li duo ren bu guai. But definitely, China has more emphasis on the manner so, and yeah, so more more emphasis on formality and politeness、mm. and yeah and protocol and everything.、Mm. And especially if you are coming as a representative of something. So if you're not just yourself, but you know, for instance, you're you're coming, you're a representative of a company, or you're working for the embassy, or you're you're a, a diplomat, say something like that.、Uh, you're all you're you're more often treated as a Representative of that group rather than、mm. as an individual, right? And it's sometimes、mm. it can be hard to break through that. Yeah, and sometimes that formality. Yeah, I just think、uh, you know I, I work hard to break out of it though because my that's part of my public image is somebody that's kind of really down to earth and、mm. and、um, and you know just sort of blends into the society. So that's something that I work at. That still, when、yep. you run into that formality, sometimes you just think, oh come on, you know, do we have to do this again? <laughs> well, this leads to our. Next question for you. So, you do comedy, and you definitely have a way to connect with people. So, what is that secret? Like, how do you use your background as a foreigner in China to connect with Chinese people? That you know. So,、Chinese、first of、people? all, the most important thing is getting away from that label. So when I go up on stage to do comedy and everything, I don't come out and immediately remind people that I'm a foreigner because everybody knows that already, right? And I don't. I don't. Operate from the perspective of a foreigner, so I think that's、um, that's a mental block. I just talk to the audience as if you know I'm here and you're here, and let's try to find what we have in common rather than talk about what our differences are. So I that's just part of my comedy is sort of finding commonality rather than coming out and saying, "Wow, I just arrived in your country, and man, this is a strange place. I don't、yep. get it. You guys are all really <laughs> strange and weird, and I'm you know I did this stupid thing today and I got in trouble." That's not what my comedy Comedy is about it all.、Mm. My comedy is sort of the opposite of that, and sort of flipping the the, the traditional stereotypes.、Mm, so, for instance, you know, so, so so that's why sometimes people say, you know, I'm more Chinese than the Chinese are, which isn't, you know, it's kind of a nice compliment, but it's not really what I'm trying to do.、Mm. But what I'm trying to do is break out of that us versus them. You know, we Chinese and you foreigners. And you know the the media in China often will ask me questions like that, like as a foreigner, what do you think? And I think, well, you know, what I think, it's not necessarily because I'm a foreigner. I just think what I think because of my particular life experiences and、mm. whatnot.、Mm. And so, sort of, sure, being a Westerner, being a Canadian, that's part of that. But that's only part of my identity, right? That doesn't that doesn't determine everything about me. Yeah. But I think I think there's sort of a tendency to lump people into groups like that, like as a Chinese, what do you think? Well. Mm. You know, so the key is to find the commonality with people and connect with people that yeah, way. Yeah, and not immediately、way. divide、mm. people into those categories, right?、Yes. So just just treat people. So I don't treat audiences as Chinese. I just I just try to figure out who's here tonight. What kind of people are these? And you know what? How what can I do that will sort of entertain and reach、mm. out to these people?、Mm. Treat people not like foreigners, but rather like seeing、yeah. every people as equal. Well, and it's difficult in China because I think this that's、mm. the cultural background and also the education system and everything is very.、Uh, and you know, I mean, in some ways, you could go way back to traditional classical Chinese culture. Um, you know, for instance, in in Confucianism, the idea that everything has a proper name,、mm. things things you have to use the proper term. That everything has has a proper term, and that's sort of important to get the right name for things. Which means you're always trying to categorize, right? You're right, trying to find the right category that things this thing fits into.、Mm. When in fact, we know, especially in modern times, a lot of things don't fit into one category. They're hybrids or they're fusion or you know they're those kind of concepts. And I think that's one thing. Uh, Chinese people perhaps have a little, you know. For so, for instance, in China, you're either Chinese or you're a foreigner, right?、Mm. It's very clear distinction.、Mm. But when you come to 
as a Chinese person, when you come to Australia and you emigrate and you become an Australian citizen, are you Chinese or are you Australian or are you, you know, who are the foreigners, right? You often mm, hear Chinese talking right. about foreigners when really what they mean is Australians. That's right. Well, I'm sorry, we're here in Australia. We're not, we are actually we're the not foreigner. foreigners anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, and as a Chinese person, if you've emigrated here and you become an Australian citizen, you're not a foreigner either, right? Mm. You're, you're still Chinese, right. but you're Australian too. Mm. And that sort of multiple layers of identity or sort of that hybrid in the middle, I think I think that's something that Chinese communities outside of China are gradually sort of adjusting to, but it's mm. kind of a kind of a mental block about mm. that in China mm. still. I find. That's so, right. for instance, here's like like a vocabulary item outside of China. We're more increasingly using the word "xiren" for mm. Westerner instead of calling them "外国人" right that's or, or "老外," calling true. them "xiren." So, and Chinese are not "中国人" because that's a nationality. Mm. Chinese are "华人." Mm. Right, which is an ethnicity. It's a cultural background. It doesn't necessarily specify what country you belong to. You could be a Malaysian Huaren, or mm. you could be an Australian Huaren. Yes. Or, or you know, so so I think that's in that sense. You know, language is evolving, and Chinese language is still evolving. And a couple of years ago, when we started talking about Xiren, everyone thought that was kind of funny, right? Like, what do you mean Xiren? Well, it's just Westerner. <laughs> yeah. You know, like for instance, you you hear new words like Yinyuren, like a musician. Mm. Mm. Yes. Right. That's not a that's not a traditional term. That's true. That that is a made up word, actually. Yeah. On the flip side, well, this is very interesting because you mentioned that Chinese used to at least still at the moment have a this distinction between the Chinese themselves and all the foreigners. On the flip side, I do think the Westerners they are getting a bit of advantage when you learn a bit of Chinese and Chinese really appreciate that. Yeah. Like, for example, myself, being a Chinese, I like struggle a lot learning English. I, but, but nobody I'm, appreciates it. I'm not an appreciator here yeah, in Australia. Everyone like, just expects it normal. It, you, you should do that. Exactly. When I just came to Australia, I brought my mom to hospital one day like, and then um, the nurse was trying to speak to me in English and expecting me to understand it because my mom couldn't understand. Yeah. And I couldn't speak anything. I couldn't understand. <laughs> the, the nurse was kind of surprised. Like, how come you young kid don't speak English, you know, that kind of look. So I I definitely think being a someone that look different to Chinese and you learn a bit of Chinese Mandarin and you travel to China, you do get a lot of appreciation. But I think it's primarily, it's it's still a numbers game. Like the number of Chinese abroad compared to the number of Westerners inside China, there's a huge gap in that proportion, right? Um, So it's just the fact that, you know, still for foreigners, learning Chinese is still relatively rare, not as rare as it used to be, but still Mm. relatively rare. And I'd have to say from the other perspective, I mean, as a as somebody who's lived and worked in China for almost 30 years now, it actually gets really tiring always being complimented on your – can you imagine like living in Australia for 20 years and every time you speak English, the first reaction is, wow, your English is really good. <laughs> like, you know, after about 20 years, that would get kind of tiring, right? That's, so I, that's true. That's so a good I, point. So I, you know, sometimes I just kind of nod or I just kind of let it go because, you know, literally you hear that like, you know, four dozen times a day. Mm. But often what you'll find is that if you don't respond to it, the person will repeat it. Ah, well, sure, you Yeah. No, you're tired. Did you hear that? I said your Chinese. Yeah. Really, yes, I heard that. And I've heard it 40 times today. Thank you. Yeah, no. So again, you know, that comes back to this Li Duo Ren Bugai, right? That's just being polite. He's being yeah. nice. He's not being, you know, it's, you can't get annoyed at him because he's, yep. he's giving you a compliment and he doesn't realize that you've heard it 400 times. I would say that is a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, it's a you good know, problem to have, I guess. Yeah. I would love someone to say, no, your English is very good every day. <laughs> I don't mind that. <laughs> okay. Well, in terms of humor, because you are a comedian, would you say there's any difference between humor of Chinese versus the humor in Western? I don't think there's really a big difference in the sense of humor. Mm-hmm. I think what the difference is is in the sense of, well, first of all, context. So, you know, the specific references. A lot of people say, I don't understand the humor. That's because you don't understand the specific cultural references, right? Mm. Or, or the language. You know, so for instance, you know, we were here during the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. I stopped in to see some of the local shows and I didn't understand what they were talking about because they're, they're talking about, and you know, maybe they're talking about things that are specific to Melbourne. Mm. And maybe it's specific only to that group of like, you know, 20 year olds in Melbourne, like maybe a 40 year old in Melbourne wouldn't understand what they're talking about either. You know, the, yep. the cultural re- references. So content and cultural references are quite different. There's also a big difference in terms of what's considered socially acceptable. So it might be funny, but, you know, should you really use that kind of humor here? Mm. Or, you know, uh, is that appropriate? There's often this kind of question. So yep. for instance, 
you know, people will sometimes laugh at a dirty joke or something, but then they'll feel kind of dirty themselves, right? Like, I shouldn't, <laughs> yeah. I shouldn't be laughing at that, and you shouldn't be saying it because that's yep. sure it was funny. I laughed and everything, but yeah, you shouldn't mm. be doing it here because yep. there's women here, there's children here, or this is you know whatever this is this setting. You shouldn't be yeah. doing that. So there's a, there's sort of a different standard. In what's acceptable? Yeah, so I guess to make Chinese people laugh, or to make anyone laugh, you have to put yourself in the other person's situation、yeah. and the culture to really understand their situation. And so, for instance, even like looking at,、um, well, not even sort of Western stand-up in Shanghai. So, for instance, going to like the Kung Fu Comedy Club in Shanghai,、um, where there's English and there's Chinese stand-up, and sort of watching the English stuff and just thinking, you know, my audience wouldn't go for that because it's just. It, they, just, they would just consider it not appropriate, but also I see sort of the younger, you know, the twenty-something Chinese guys doing Chinese stand-up, and they're primarily performing to an audience of twenty-somethings, millennials and whatnot. And I think, yeah, you know, those I think that's that's funny, but you know, my audience wouldn't necessarily like that because I get、mm. a lot of middle-aged people out to my audience. That's true. I have to, you know, I deal with a very broad audience, right?、Mm. Young, young, middle-aged, and old. So I, I think. Uh, often it's sort of context. It's not so much the sense of humor.、Mm. You know,、yep. for instance, you know, Chinese people like sexual humor just as much as anyone else. And in fact, if you're like just a couple of guys together having a few beers,、mm. I mean, Chinese people talk just like any other. You know, young guys hanging around having a couple of beers,、yep. it can get pretty rough. But again,、yep. you, you, it's in that context,、mm. and it's considered. Uh, unacceptable outside of that context. Sure. So when you're learning Chinese, obviously you have learned it so long ago. But is there a tool or a website or an app that you cannot live without when you learn Chinese? The one app I would definitely recommend right off the top is called Pleco, P L E C O,、mm -hmm. and that, as far as I know, is the number one、uh, online dictionary. It's a it's an app,、mm. uh, Android and.、Um, Uh, iOS, and it's developed by a guy called Michael Love. I follow him on Twitter. He's a really interesting guy, and he's American based and、uh, learned Chinese, speaks fluent Chinese. So in in that sense, he's also got this sort of Chinese as a second language、um, perspective,、mm. and he brings that in. So that's that's、cool. by far what I find the best、cool. online dictionary.、Cool. You, and you could do Chinese to English or English to Chinese. And one of the things, one of the reasons I have to recommend that is because if you actually put in the name Dashan. In the dictionary, I'm in his dictionary. Nice. Yes, famous Canadian celebrity known for speaking fluent Chinese and performing <laughs> blah 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 and everything. I thought, man, when you're a that's nice. When you have your own entry in the dictionary, that's really a sign you've made it, right? That is, think, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, give him a little bit of a plug. So, if you were to recommend our listeners only one book in learning Chinese and the Chinese culture or the Chinese culture, what would that be? Oh boy. Boy, you're really going to stick me with that one. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, the deep answer would be to say something like the Analects of Confucius or something. Wow!、Right? But、uh, who's going to read that?、Um, okay, here's one. It's called China in Ten Words or something, and it's originally written in Chinese, but it's translated to English. Right, China in Ten Words. China in Ten Words,、All、and、right. it's called.、Uh, Shi Ge Zi Hui Li, the Zhongguo, or something like that, right? And it's basically it's ten keywords, and they're interesting. I mean, they're really fascinating choices, and、um, that's a really good、uh, description of sort of modern Chinese society. Sure. To our listeners, all the resources we mentioned in the show will be all in the show notes. So after the show, the listeners will be able to. Go to our website、yeah. to see the link to all the resources we mentioned. So that's sort of off the top of my head a book that I read just a few years ago. I'd also would mention the website Baidu,、um, which of course is the、mm -hmm. Chinese version of Google. It's、yep. the Chinese.、Uh, you know, any time I'm doing a Chinese language service, I would actually go to Baidu first、mm. over Google. Of course, Google is way better than Baidu for English. Baidu、mm -hmm. is a disaster if you're trying to search for something in English. That's right. But if you're trying to search in Chinese, it's actually a very good.、Um, it's actually a very good resource. So. For instance, I often like. I'm not sure if I come up with a phrase, and I'm not sure. Like, do people commonly use this phrase? You go on Baidu and you search it, and you'll see. Okay, yeah, lots of websites use this phrase. That's、mm. okay. I guess it's a common phrase. And then, as part of the Baidu University、uh, universe, there's also an online dictionary that's just D I C T dot Baidu dot com.、Mm. So it's called Baidu Tsidi and the Baidu Dictionary.、Mm. And that you know, online dictionaries, you have to. 
take with a grain of salt. They're not always accurate. But you can go from Baidu Dictionary and you can take that little phrase and put it into Baidu itself mm -hmm. and see how people use that in context. That's some good tip there. So teach our audience your favorite Chinese quote or a phrase or expression. You know, I don't know why this sticks in my head, but one thing I've always liked... It always seems to me to be a very elegant and beautiful phrase, but actually it's very kind of direct. It's not all that po poetic or something, but I remember sometimes seeing over the top of a door, you'll see people have a sign hung up that says, Tai Tou Jian Xi. Tai Tou Jian Xi. Tai Tou Jian Xi. And I just thought that's a really good philosophy for life. So, you you know, Tai Tou, raise your head, look up. Mm -hmm. And what do you see? You see Xi. Well, Xi is sort of happiness or uh she is more than happiness isn't it it's just mm -hmm. it's just it's just joyfulness joyfulness yeah mm. look up and see the joy and i just think yeah you know that's true like all of us especially now in the cell phone age we've always we've always got our head down <laughs> so you know, physically as well as metaphorically we're often sort of looking down we're watching the road we're watching our feet we're watching our cell phones sometimes you just need to see a, look up and see the joy mm. look up and see that joy so tai tou jian xi that's a great sharing of the phrase. So if you are to give our audience one single piece of advice in learning Chinese, what would that be? Speak up. Speak up. Yeah, Short just give, yeah don't, uh, I, uh, I don't be afraid of making mistakes because it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter what mistakes you make in language. People basically communicate heart to heart. So it really doesn't matter if you totally screw up the language because if people can sense through your body language, through your eyes, through your you know, you're, you're just your general feeling. People can kind of get what you're trying to express. Mm -hmm. And the words aren't all that important. So, so mm -hmm. don't be afraid to try to communicate. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah. So one last question. How can our listeners reach you? How can they reach me? Oh, that's easy. Uh, my stage name, of course, is Dashan, D-A-S-H-A-N. And my website is at Dashan.com. And from there, you can find links to my Twitter, my Facebook, my WeChat, my Weibo, and uh, and my email contact. So dashan.com. Sure. I'll put all the resources mentioned in the show um, to our website. So Dashan, thank you so much for sharing so much valuable information with our listeners. Thank you. My so pleasure. It was your, a lot of fun. Yeah, your journey is truly inspirational. And to our listeners, the show note is now available at chinesetalkease.com slash one. Talk is is spelled as T A L K E Z E. Do you know how to order food in Chinese? In just a few short video lessons, you will have the confidence to walk into a Chinese restaurant and order your food in Chinese. Just head over to ChineseTalkEase.com/slash order food. Talk is is spelled as T A L K E Z E. How good is your pronunciation? I was born and raised in Beijing, China, and I have put together a short video series that will teach you how to pronounce five of the most difficult Chinese pronunciations perfectly. Just head over to ChineseTalkEase.com slash pinyin. That is P-I-N-Y-I-N. If you have enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Each month, I will choose one reviewer and give out a one-year subscription to all my premium video lessons for free. That's it for now. I will see you in the next episode.